Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm doing yes. good. I'm glad to be with you. Praise God. We're so happy to have you here. All right. Before we start our Sabbath worship, let's pray in our heart. <clears throat> For an opening song, we will hear from Clarice Libini. Clarice, are you there? Hello. Hi. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So our opening song is 206, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee. My breath. Just blood I shed the dumbest and quicken from the day I gave I gave my life for thee what hast thou given for me? My father's house of life, my glory sacred throne, I left for every night, no wandering sad and lone. I left What hast thou left for me? I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell. Oh, be For the opening song that you have offered to us. Right now, before we start, we would like to uh, give a little background of this Sabbath worship. We're actually, uh, this DAF uh, stands from Italian 
International Seventh Day Adventist Fellowship. We're in China, and we are happy. We are very happy that Pastor Pablo Goya uh, wants to speak for us this Sabbath, and we want everyone to join us and to to have and listen uh, to the Word of God through Him. That's why we open this uh, to everyone, and thank you for everyone who already joined us. So this rundown is um, as use as our usual worship on Sabbath, and. Um, Therefore, that's why we have the singing as the opening song for one family or one account so that everyone can sing in their respective place. And please continue to pray for the connection so that we all can have a smooth worship today. As we all know, this is a great controversy that Satan will work hard uh, so that we will not listen to the word of God. All right, and therefore we would like to again, once again, um, give you a warm welcome from Dalian, China. And right now we will hear uh, and we will pray together intercessory prayer led by Sister Christy. Hello, happy Sabbath. Can everyone hear my voice? Yes, happy Sabbath, sister. Uh, praise the Lord. We are going Still within our hearts and minds, Lord, and help us, Lord, so we would not sin against you. And that we're more. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> 
praise God for the prayer, although perhaps her her voice is breaking, but we believe we all pray in our respective place. And although we do not pray together, but we are still praying in the same room, which is the prayer. Right now, we will collect offering for Italian this stuff. We will send to our treasurer and the code will be sent through WeChat. And for other people from other churches, we encourage you to send to your respective uh, church. Uh, and therefore, right now we will hear a reading, a offering reading by Emily Slibingi. Emily, are you there? Hi, Emily, are you there? Sister Lee Bingy? All right, while waiting for Sister Clarice, we will go forward to listen to the special song uh, will be sung by William and Joaquin Bunga.
Amen. Amen. Yes, indeed. He will buy till the end. Praise God for the song. Right now, we will hear offering reading by Sister Lovely. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. We're reading the Sabbath. The title is Why Vows Are Important. It was Sabbath morning and the pastor was conducting a renewal of vow ceremony. This would encourage members to recommit themselves to keep the Sabbath, to be faithful to their spouses, and also to vow to return the tithe and a percentage of their income as offering. Martha was not comfortable with the latter. Why should I make a vow about offerings? She asked Jackie, who gave her Bible studies. Can I just give as my heart is stirred, or if I trust that there is a project worthy to be supported, says Martha. Jackie told her that as our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. We cannot just trust in our feelings or impulses to do what is right. Jackie also mentioned that, according to Ellen G. White, it is unsafe for us to be controlled by feelings or impulse when we give our gifts because our natural inclination for selfishness is stronger than love. And so, as a rule, evil gains the victory. She also says that, if we are controlled by impulse or more human sympathy, we may stop giving if our efforts are repaid, repaid with ingratitude or if our gifts are abused or squandered. That is why Christians should act from a fixed principle following the Savior's example of self-denial and self-sacrifice. So, said Jackie, Vows or promises, humbly taken in God's presence, will tell him that we allow his spirit to replace our selfish heart of stone by a heart of his own creation, willing to act from a fixed principle and to fulfill his will. We do not promise that we will do it by our own strength, but by his miracle in us, added Jackie. As it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Philippians 2, verse 13. After earnestly praying, Martha decided that she would no longer be controlled by feelings, projects, or sympathy on her giving, but by principle, following a percentage of her income to be given regularly and systematically as offering. Appeal for us this Sabbath? Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Let all who are around him bring presents to him who ought to be feared. Psalm 76 for 11. Let us all bow our head in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day. Though we may be uh, separated by distance, Lord, but we could gather here to worship you. Father, we just listened to the offertory reading. May you help us, Father, change our heart, Lord, that we may uh, feel with the Holy Spirit, that we may have Jesus in our heart, Lord, that you may mold us, Lord, and you may help us to uh, not be selfish, Father, uh, that we can uh, give our life, also give our offering, only to uh, bring glory to your name. Help us, Father, to uh, have this vow to you and the promise, Father, and help us to fulfill. We cannot do it by our own self, Father, but we uh, are. We can do it only by your grace. Thank you so much, dear, dear Lord. 
May you be with us for the rest of this Sabbath day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And right now we will listen to the sermon by Pastor Pavel Goya. Pastor Pavel Goya is a, um, um, a, a pastor from Romania. I'm sorry, I just lost my words. Um, he is an associate ministerial uh, secretary from GC and also editorial for ministry magazines. And we would love to hear more from of the word from of God from him. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Good morning. Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, Pastor. It's a privilege to be with you. I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes. Very well, Pastor. Okay. Very Wonderful. Well. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, yeah, I am not used. This is a new experience for me. I am used to speak in front of people, <laughs> not in front of the computer. But for the last few weeks, I started to get used. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new experience. Something that if somebody told us uh, six months ago, one year ago, we would not have believed. And uh, Ellen White talks clearly <clears throat> about the final events that they will be uh, in rapid succession, rapid ones. Things are going to move faster than we can keep up with. And in this situation, we need to understand that Jesus is coming soon. And I'm not saying that this is the end, but I am saying that, as Jesus said, the final events will be like the labor of the pregnancy. Uh, this is the beginning of the end. Basically, it's going to get worse and worse. And uh, it is time to prepare. You cannot prepare for the final crisis when you are in the crisis. You don't prepare for the final exam for the medical school the night before. You need to prepare way in advance. And today is the time to prepare, not tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> and people talk a lot about preparation. And there are many things that we should do. But the most important one is to know Jesus. If we don't know our God, it really doesn't matter what we do. I say again and again in my messages to people, we, with honest heart, believe that we seek Jesus. We, with honesty, want to follow Jesus. I was reading today from Desire of Ages that his people, Israel, uh, that kept Sabbath and went to the synagogue, to church, as we say, uh, his people that were waiting for Messiah, they didn't even know that they are not actually connected to him. Even his own disciples, after three years and a half that they spent with him and heard him every day, still they were blind to his mission. They were expecting him to give them freedom, to give them a victory over their enemies, to give them blessings, to heal them. And that's what we do. Most of the time we go to prayer asking God, to give us uh, blessings, to heal us, to give us a job, to solve our problems, to basically we seek God for our needs, for temporary, temporary things, for his blessings. We rarely forget ourselves and our needs to seek God just with a desire to know him. And uh, is more than that they had a feeling that to, to do what is right is to be careful to, to keep Sabbath and keep all the doctrines and go to church and return tithe faithfully and uh, to pray and to study. Those are good things. They are necessary things, but they have no value. So many times our people in our churches, they go to church, they do the right thing, but they don't have a personal relationship with God. They don't know God for themselves. That's the reason when a crisis comes, when a disease, 
uh, a cancer or a death in the family or loss of a job, any type of trial, when, when they come, we lose our heart and we panic. The Bible says that you keep him in perfect peace, him whose eyes are fixed on you in Isaiah. Basically, if we know him, we can say like the three young men in the fiery furnace will not worship and he can save us. And even if he doesn't, we are okay with that. And they were not alone. God didn't come to be with them only in the fiery furnace. God was with them before. It's a mistake to try to know God and to seek his presence in the crisis unless you have his presence continually, daily. Our experience should not be based on a crisis or a need, but on relationship and love. And I'm going to go from there and <clears throat> explain a little. And people that know Jesus and they talk to him all the time, they don't need to struggle and talk to him in crisis. People that are connected continually don't need to seek a connection in crisis. Um, how do we know God? So many people pray and study, but it's not enough to pray and study. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you seek the scriptures because you believe that in them you have eternal life. But they testify of me. Basically, if you study the scripture, because it's a duty or to be saved, that's not good enough. We need to study the scripture with one purpose alone, to know God. Because eternal life is to know God. That's what Moses wanted. I want to know you. I want to see you. Please show me who you are. That's what David wanted. He says, I want to know you. I want you more than life. I want you more than water. I want you more than food. I want you more than blessings. Uh, he says, in a dry land where there is no water, I've seen you in your sanctuary. You are better than food. You are better than anything else. Basically, we must have, a, he says, as a deer faints for the water, so my soul is thirsty, is fainting for you. We must have a, a, an extreme desire and thirst and hunger to know God. It should be the goal, the priority, the center, the reason for our life. It should be above anything else. That's the very reason Jesus says, who doesn't give up mother and father and husband and wife and sister and brother and even his own job, even his own health, even his own life is not worthy to be my disciple. Basically, anything that comes before God, it's your God. That's the reason Jesus says that uh, eternal life is to know him. That's the very reason Paul says, and I want to know him and to be one with him and to know his suffering and his death and his resurrection. After a life of service, Paul the apostle, at the end, a few years before dying, towards the end of his life, and he still says, and to know him. My desire, my reason to live is to know him. Basically, the more you know him, the more you love him, the more you understand him, the more you trust him. And then the more you want him and seek him even more. And so, <clears throat> how do you know God? It's not enough to pray, but you must pray with a thirst to know him and you must seek him more than anything else. I uh, tell the story again and again and again and again. When uh, I put my eyes on my wife, she was three, I was six. Yeah, she was only three years old and I was only six years old. And... Uh, I told my sister, I'm going to marry that girl. And my sister said, you are just a child. You are only six years old. You don't know what love is. You are going to change your mind a thousand times. Well, I kept my eyes on her. And I started to learn about her. And I started to desire to be in her presence. And I went to the same school she went. And we lived in the same neighborhood. And we went to the same church. And we sang in the same choir. And um, I knew what ice cream she likes, and I knew what uh, 
uh, color she likes and I knew what music she likes and I learned everything about her. And I was watching her and I was dreaming of her and basically my mind was all focused on her. And uh, we started, that was when I was six, we started to date when I was about uh, uh, 18 and she was about 15. We got married when I was about 21. And now I'm 56, we have been together for uh, 33, 34 years, more or less. And I tell you, even now, our love has been growing more and more and more to the point that I cannot function, I cannot breathe, I cannot sleep, I cannot eat without her. And uh, wherever I travel, when I speak in different places and I go for meetings, I call her on, on uh, WhatsApp and in the evening when I go to sleep, I watch her, how she, how she falls asleep and I'm happy to just watch her. Um, when I talk to her, I don't call her because I have a need. I just call her to hear her voice. When is the last time when you talk to God just to hear his voice? When is the last time when you talk to God just because you wanna watch him? You don't want to ask anything. You do have needs, everybody does. But you don't go there because you want him to do something for you. You are there because you wanna watch him and to be with him because you are in love with him. Unless we have this type of, of, of passionate love for God, uh, we have only a form of religion. And that's eternal life, to love God more than anything with all your heart, with all your mind, all your strength, all your soul, more than anything else. I remember when I was in uh, university, they told me that if I don't go to school on Saturdays, they will expel me and I will never be able to register in any school for the rest of my life ever again. It was a big deal, the end of my education. <clears throat> And it was very difficult to go to get accepted in a university in that time in Romania. It was extremely difficult. And so uh, I went to prayer as every good Adventist does. And I prayed a lot that God would save my education. And I struggled in prayer as so many people struggle in prayer because our prayers should not be focused on self or our own needs. In all life, in all Jesus' life, you don't see him praying for himself, only praying for others. One time he prayed for himself in Gethsemane, take the cup from me if possible. And God said, no, you have to drink the cup. Basically, <clears throat> all over the Bible, again and again and again, we are taught that we are called to serve others, to pray for others, to love others, to be a blessing for others, to be salt for others, to be light for others, to preach the gospel to others, to give to others, to pray for others, to bless others. I don't see a place where he says that we are called to serve self. And that's one of the, of the reasons we don't get blessings because we want to be blessed instead of seeking to be a blessing. Ellen White has so many quotations where she says the single way to be blessed is when you seek a blessing to share. <clears throat> and so going back, <clears throat> when is the last time that you prayed with that compassion, with that desire, with that uh, thirst, that Lord, I do have needs, I do have problems, but I want you more than a solution for my needs or help for my needs. I want you even if I die. I want you even if I lose my job. I want you even if I uh, lose my health. I want you more than life. Please, I'm not gonna let you go. Help me know you. Because the Bible says that if we seek him with all our heart, he would let himself be found. The Bible says that if we draw near to him, <clears throat> he will draw near to us. In fact, it's a constant, it's a present continuum. It's a, it's a constant, ongoing auction in the in the Greek verb there, where he says, if you draw near to him, he says, if you keep drawing, uh, getting, seeking to get near to him, he will keep getting closer and closer and closer to you. That's an ongoing uh, auction. The closer we wanna get to him, the closer he gets to us. He will not instantly come close to us. And then I says in the side of ages that if Jesus called 
all the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, they would have not be able to support the light. Only the three that are closer to him were ready for it. And so basically, he will get you a, a little closer as much as you can handle. And then you seek him more. And then he'll get even closer. And as the light grows gradually, our spiritual maturity is going to grow gradually to the point that we'll know him more and more and more and deeper and deeper to the point that he'll move in our hearts. And people will see us and they will see Jesus and you'll live like him and you'll be controlled uh, by him. <clears throat> That's what Jesus says. Jesus used to wake up early in the morning and pray and be filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and to receive the plans from the Father. He says in Desire of Ages that he didn't do anything from himself. He didn't talk from himself. He didn't act. He didn't make plans. He followed God's plans. And then she says there that we should surrender daily our plans and be ready to follow God's plan for that day. Imagine when you seek him so much, you become one with him and he can lead you, he can talk to you. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few examples. <clears throat> uh, it's very, very simple. An example from our daily life, nothing major. Uh, we used to live in Kentucky, and that's somewhere towards south of the country. And our son and his wife and our granddaughter lived in Wisconsin, and that's very north at the border with Canada. <clears throat> there was about seven, eight hour drive between us. So uh, they uh, would have to drive south every two, three months to visit with us. What happened? Uh, our daughter-in-law finished uh, her uh, bachelor and she wanted to go to get her master's. We uh, prayed that God would somehow open the doors, that they would move close to us. But uh, she applied and uh, uh, it was a little too late when she applied, they said, registration was finished for this year. You can, you need to apply next year. Now, uh, we know the Bible says that all things work together for the benefit of those who love the Lord. Now it's easy to say all things, but you need to realize that all things means all things, including when we go through trials. We need to thank God for our trials. God allows them for a purpose. God doesn't rejoice in allowing trials. But if there is something in our character that must be changed, unless, unless we change that, we cannot be useful in God's work and we cannot be a blessing to anybody and we cannot go even to heaven. <clears throat> so for our own benefit, God allows trials because the fiery furnace is purifying the gold. And God has a bigger picture in mind than we do. We, we look for uh, limited temporary needs. God is lo lo looking for more important things. And so all things work together <clears throat> and we are never alone. Even when we go to trial, God is with us. Though sometimes we fix our eyes on problems instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. And that's one of the biggest problems because if we kept our eyes on him, we will not struggle when we go to trials because we will see him, we will not see the problems. But back to the story, we personally, myself, I was disappointed. I wanted them close to us because I just, uh, uh, we have a very good relationship and uh, we wanted to be close and we wanted to, our granddaughter to be close to us and so on and so forth. And so I was not happy. I said, hey, Lord, I prayed about it and they didn't get accepted and I was making plans. You know, maybe they wait one year and next year she applies again and they move close to us in Kentucky to school. Uh, I want to <clears throat> mention that our daughter-in-law said, why don't we take a, pray, a, a week and we pray about it? And we all took a week and we prayed for God's plan. In the beginning, I prayed that God would bring them close to us. That was my plan. I prayed that God would fulfill my plan, that God would answer my prayer. That's what we, you, that's what we always do. We ask God to fulfill our plan. Basically, we make God a servant, so he has to do whatever we ask. And God should be the master, not the servant. We should do what he says, not God what we say. So in the beginning, we ask God to fulfill our plan to bring our children close to us. 
But then <clears throat> we switch prayer. Instead of asking God to bring them close to us, we ask God to do whatever he wants. And we say, Lord, you need to show them where they need to go to school. We would love to have them close, but may your will be done. So we ask you to make that decision where they should move. Well, we prayed for a week. <clears throat> After a week, she got an invitation to move to Pennsylvania to go to school. I was so frustrated, so disappointed because we lived towards South in Kentucky. They lived in Wisconsin, North, seven, eight hours away. But Pennsylvania was even farther away, Northeast, like from Kentucky, maybe 12 hours away, I don't know. And so instead of getting closer to us, they got farther away from us. I was so frustrated that God didn't answer the prayer that we prayed and the, the desire of our hearts to be close to our children. But we said, you know, may your will be done. We accept it. Well, three months later, after they moved to Pennsylvania, I got called to move at the general conference, basically to move north, two, three hours south of Pennsylvania. I want you to imagine if our kids would have moved south and three months later, we would have moved north. <laughs> You understand? God knew the future and God worked in a way that when we moved, we were only two hours away from them instead of 12 hours away from them. We so many times ask God to do something and God may do something totally different. And we don't understand. Like the disciples, they were praying that God would deliver them from Romans, that God would give them victory, that God would give them healing and God would give them bread and God would give them... Uh, <clears throat> all these temporary things. But Jesus didn't answer that prayer. In fact, he was crucified on a cross and the disciples were so disappointed, but it was for their own benefit and salvation. So many times God answers our prayer and we are totally blind to the way he works. And while he works for our best benefit, we are disappointed and we say God doesn't answer. And we forget that he gave Jesus. If he gave Jesus, how will he not also in Jesus give us all things? If he loves us so much that he gave Jesus, is he going to keep anything from, from his children? <clears throat> but God <clears throat> knows the future. God knows the bigger picture. God knows our hearts. God has a plan. And God says, I know the plans I have for you. So many times, <clears throat> so many times in our lives, God cannot fulfill the plan because we ruin it again and again and again and again daily. Like Israel, <clears throat> the spirit of prophecy says that God wants you to lead them straight and quick to the promised land and to establish them there happy, healthy, blessed. <clears throat> but because of their unbelief, their lack of trust in God, because their daily rebellion, because they wanted what they wanted, not what God wanted. They spent 40 years and died in the wilderness. It is the same with us. If we would just trust in him, he could fulfill his plan for our daily life. God has a plan for us. And God has the power to fulfill that plan. But in order to trust in him to the point that you fully surrender, <clears throat> you need to know him closely. It's, it's extremely difficult to fully surrender. It's a lot easier it's a lot easier to keep Sabbath, to return tithe, to go to church and sing in the choir. It's a lot easier, but it's very difficult to fully surrender and trust in him when you don't understand. And that's what God requires of us. He asks us to die daily to self, to fully surrender all to, how much? All to Jesus, I surrender. Basically, God wants us to fully surrender and fully trust in his plan and in his wisdom and in his power and in his love and to understand that we are not alone. And even when we don't understand what is going on, it's part of his plan and he's working on our character, even through trials, he's preparing us. And we should daily fix our eyes on him and praise him and say, I trust in you. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you another example. Uh, I started to tell you about the school. I want to finish that story. I was in school in the university. They told me, if you don't come 
on Saturdays to school, you'll be expelled. I pray that God would uh, save my education. And I kept praying and I got no answer. And it was Monday and it was Tuesday and I knew Saturday, I mean, I mean Friday is gonna be my last day of education, my last day of school. Well, as I prayed and prayed and prayed and I got no answer and I struggled in prayer, as we struggled in prayer, my father advised me to stop praying for my school and stop praying for my needs and stop praying for what I think I should pray and rather pray for what God wants me to pray. So my father said, you know, you think that it's good for you to get education, but God may want something different for you. You need to surrender your education. Whatever you keep, you lose. Whatever you give up for Jesus, that's what you save. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Who is willing to lose his life will save it. And so my father said, you need to surrender your school. And instead of praying for your school, you should pray that God would do whatever he wants, whatever would honor him and serve him. Basically, if you being in school would honor God, yes, let me be in school. But if, if you being out of school would honor God and serve him, then you should say, Lord, let me lose my school. Basically, don't pray for what you need. Pray for what God needs. Don't pray, God, uh, help me with this job. Rather say, Lord, do whatever would honor you, even if I suffer, whatever would serve you, even if it's not a good job, even if, if it doesn't pay well, even if I don't like what it is, move me wherever you want. If God wanted to put Joseph in prison, who wants to go to prison? You got to be crazy to desire to go to prison. But unless Joseph would have accepted to go to prison, God could have never used him. You need to trust in God to the point that you are ready to accept whatever he does, though you may not understand, you may not know the future. He knows the future and he has a plan and you need to fully trust in him. So that's what my father told me. So <clears throat> I went to prayer and I prayed a dif different prayer. I said, Lord, I really would like to finish my school. But if my presence there would honor you, let me be in school not to get an education, not to get a job or a salary, but to be a witness for you there. And if it's better for your honor and for your work to lose school, though it hurts, I'm willing to accept it to lose school. Do whatever would be best for your kingdom, for your work, not for me. In that moment when I was willing to surrender, <clears throat> I got peace, such a strong peace that like never before, I knew in that moment that God answered my prayer. I could sense his very presence next to me so strong that I was afraid to open my eyes. And for some reason, I stopped praying. I was afraid to open my mouth. I said, what should I say? He's right here and he's God. He knows everything. I, I'm, I'm afraid to even open my mouth. Whatever I say, he knows. There is nothing I can tell him that he, he knows my thoughts. He knew my thoughts and my days before I was born. And so when I accepted his will and I was ready to surrender my school, in that moment, I had such a strong peace that I basically, I kept quiet. And I started, after a few seconds of quietness, I started to sing a song, the one that trusts in the Lord. Nothing can happen to him. Uh, <clears throat> the melody is pa 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 And the Romanian words, the one that trusts in his father, he never struggles, he always has peace, whatever he goes through. And so I had peace and I started to sing this song. I went to school and I met the secretary and she says, Goya, you really need to come Saturdays to school. I said, lady, if God wants to save my education, he will, he has the power. If not, I would rather lose my school than lose my God. She said, Goya, are you crazy? There is no God. Have you seen God? I said, yep. You are crazy. Nobody has seen God. God doesn't exist. There is nobody that can save you. Nobody can save you from the power of the government. Nobody. I said, lady, I would rather lose school. And so she said, oh, you are crazy. You lost your mind. Next day, 
it was Friday, <clears throat> my last day of school before being uh, expelled. I went to school and she was kind of pale, yellow. And I said, are you okay? Do you have the flu or something? And she says, oh, I, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm not sick. I said, what, what is with you? And she says, Goya, I, I am in shock. I said, why? You had an accident or something? She says, no. <clears throat> she says, I want you to be honest. Do you know the president of the country? I said, yeah, I see him on TV. She says, no, 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 no. Do you know him personally? Are you friends, family, relatives? Do you talk to him, you eat together? I said, lady, are you kidding me? Me and the president of the country, come on. Who can get close to him? And she says, do you know anybody in the government? I said, nope. All I know about government, in front of the government building, there are thousands of roses. When I don't have money to buy flowers for my wife, I go there and pick a flower for free. <laughs> she says, Goya, do you know what happened today? I said, no. Somebody died? She says, no. You, you don't know? I said, no, I don't know. She says, at 7 a.m., the president spoke on television. Uh, he said, we need to save the economy. And in order to save the economy, starting today, Friday, we are going to close all schools in all country every Saturday. From now on, there will be no school on Saturdays. And we'll save so much electricity, so much heat, so much power, and so much. And, and she said, if this law came next week, you would have been out. And she said, there is a God. I said, well, I, I told you there is a God. <laughs> when, when you fully surrender, and you put God before school, before job, before health, before family, before yourself, before anything else, then only then God can work. Not only focus on self, but only focus on Jesus and forget self. That's the reason Paul says, and I cast there all things garbage for the price of knowing the Lord Jesus, my Lord. I count all things rubbish, garbage for the price of knowing Jesus. That's life eternal. To know him so much that you desire him more than anything, literally anything else. That's the single way that God can change you and use you. As long as we are focused on self, we can receive no power. We will use it in a wrong way. Only when we fully give up self and fully surrender and know him and depend on him, only then God can give us unlimited power because then we will allow him to use us and to control us and we will not use those blessings and that power in a selfish way, but we will use it in the way he says to serve others, to be a blessing for others, to serve God. <clears throat> That's the reason Levi says in seven testimonies, chapter 32, I mean, uh, seven testimonies, page, sorry, page 30, 31, 32. She says, to everyone who fully surrenders withholding nothing, Unlimited heavenly power is provided for the attainment of measureless results to everyone that fully surrenders, withholding nothing. Unlimited heavenly power is provided for the attainment of measureless results. A few paragraphs later, she says, all that the disciples did, every church member should do today, if we would surrender the way they did. That's re religion. Religion is not what you do for Jesus, but who you know. Religion is not because we go to church and keep Sabbath and eat healthy and know the doctrines and study the Bible and pray every morning, every evening and at meals. That's not religion. Pharisees did that better than we do. Religion is to desire God more than anything. And when you study, you don't study to do your duty. Oh, I read three chapters today. Ellen Wright, in fact, doesn't even say read three chapters. She says, take, and I have the quotation. She says, take one Bible verse. That's just one Bible verse. And she says, pray over it. Read it again and again and again. Memorize it. Ask the Lord 
to show you what he wanted to say in that Bible verse. Read it again. Pray that the Holy Spirit who inspired that verse would inspire you to understand the verse. Read it again. And basically she says, eat it. As Jesus says, unless you eat my body and you drink my blood, you cannot be saved. Jesus, his body is the world. Unless we assimilate, Jesus is the world. Unless we assimilate, digest the world to the point that we eat it and it goes in our body and it, it goes in our cells and we are filled with it and we contemplate and reflect upon it and we basically want to, to, to seek him and to know him and to be filled with him. Unless we have that desire, study will do nothing for us. So many people read, and then they go to church and they fight each other and they go home and they fight each other and they have no peace and they have no power and they have a religion of forms called powerless. Why don't we have power today? God never changed. God has power. God performed miracles in the past. The disciples performed miracles. Why don't we have power? Because we seek blessings instead of seeking Jesus. Basically, if you go to prayer, and you just pray to do your duty or to solve a problem. Prayer is not going to help you. Unless you go to prayer, to surrender, and to know God. To fully let him take over. Prayer is not going to do anything for you. So many people pray in the world. And yet, they kill each other. Everything that we do in our religious life should have one single focus and reason to know God, to fully know him, to fully surrender, to fully trust in him, fully serve him. That's religion. I'm not going to go on and on and on, uh, but <clears throat> God is challenging the church to experience that. Only when we have that experience, the church will be revived. I'm going to read a few quotations for you if you give me a second. Uh, okay, here. Listen, there is nothing that Satan fears as much as the people of God would remove every hindrance that they can receive the Holy Spirit. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to read the next one. People in the church must be taught not to be satisfied with the form of religion without the power. If we are intent upon searching Jesus for Jesus and putting away our sins, our evil tendencies, we should abide in God. A revival of, of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent need among all our needs. To seek that should be our first work. Now listen carefully, let me. The Father is more willing to give us his spirit more than we are willing to ask for him. A revival needs to be expected only in answer to prayer. People are destitute of God's spirit and they don't appreciate the preaching of the word and the power of the spirit doesn't touch their heart and the discourses are without effect. I could go on and on and on, but you see, uh, I'm looking for more paragraphs. God doesn't want his people to do what they think that is best and to pray for what they think that is best. He wants them to do what he knows that is best. Isn't that powerful? <clears throat> Anyway, the church needs to arouse to action. The Spirit of God can never come before we prepare the way. We should earnestly search our hearts. We should unite in persevering prayer and through faith claim the promise of God. There should be deep humiliation. We should humble ourselves and then he will bless us if we seek him. I'm not going to continue to read paragraphs. 
but I have a whole list of paragraphs that show that revival, surrender, prayer, the Holy Spirit are our most important needs. And we pray for so many other things. And so little we pray for the Holy Spirit, so little we pray for revival, so little we pray to know God, so little we pray to serve him. What if we changed our prayers? We will experience the power the big people of prayer, big people of faith in the Bible experienced. Think about Moses. He was a man like us. Think about Elijah, Joseph, Daniel, Abraham, Paul, people that walked with God, people that spoke with God, people that God performed miracles, amazing miracles through them, people that saved nations. God wants to do that again. That's not based on my power or your power. That's based on God's power. And he can do it again and again for those that walk with him, for those that seek him, <clears throat> for those that want him more than anything else, for those that fully, daily, continually surrender. <clears throat> I want to finish with one quick story. Uh, when I was in the army, uh, they asked me to work on Sabbath, and they said, uh, "If you don't work, you go between seven and fourteen years to fourteen years to prison." And uh, they said, "Nobody can save you, absolutely nobody." And uh, I was a little crazy. I was young. They took me in the place where we did all the instruction, all the exercise, and they it was Sabbath, and they put all the weapons on me, and they said. Uh, the aviation, the enemy is coming with airplanes and they are gonna throw bombs. You need to hide. You need to dig a hole in the ground and hide. And I said, I cannot dig a hole, it's Sabbath, I'm not gonna work. And they said, the enemy is coming with airplanes. I said, okay, I am already hidden. <clears throat> they cannot see me. They said, we don't see the hole. I said, well, I don't see the airplanes either. And they said, what if the airplanes came? I said, well, there is no airplane. And if they came, God can hide me, you know? And they said, you need to dig a hole. I said, not gonna happen. It's Sabbath, I'm not gonna work. The commander got so angry that I refused to execute, execute his order in front of every soldier. And so he left me there. He went back to the garrison and he had an emergency meeting with all the officers. Meanwhile, I went back to the garrison and I went in the warehouse, in the storage room, and I locked myself inside and I started to pray. He went, he called a meeting with all the officers and he proposed 14 years prison for me. In the beginning, I prayed for freedom, but as I prayed, I said, you know, what if Joseph would have prayed for freedom? God would have never used him. And I said, Lord, I would like to be free, nevertheless. May your will be done. I give you permission to do with my freedom, whatever you want. And if it would honor you to be free, let me live not for me, but to serve you. And if it honors you that I go to prison, let me go to prison and serve you in prison. Do whatever would honor you and serve you, not me. I need to give up myself. I need to, to, to forget self. I need to sacrifice self. I need to surrender self and allow your will to be done. While I was praying this prayer, somebody knocked in the door. I opened the door, it was a sergeant. Chuchu Mihai was his name. No, Chuchu Mariana, I'm sorry, long time since I finished army. And he says, Goya, do you know the general of the first army of Romania? I said, no, you don't know him. I said, nope, wow, are you sure you, you don't lie? You are not relatives or friends, I said, don't know him, don't know his name. He says, well, he came without announcing his visit, a surprise visit to check our garrison, 5,000 soldiers to check the whole building, everything. And uh, he told us to leave you alone. I said, you kidding me? He doesn't know me, he does, I am nobody. And then he left. And then a Lieutenant came, Barbulescu. He says, Goya, do you know the commander of the first army of Romania? I said, no. He came and he talked about you. And I said, well, tell me the story. He says, well, he came and we were in a meeting to put you in prison. 
And he says, I came and I visited the whole garrison, all the buildings, all the bedrooms, all the exercise field, the museum, the warehouse, I visited everything. And he says, <clears throat> last time the road was broken, now the road is fixed. Very nice job, who fixed the road? And they said, well, Goya did. Last time you had broken windows, right now all windows are fixed. Who fixed the windows? Uh, well, Goya did. Last time in the warehouse, there were stolen things. When you're exercising with the soldiers uh, up on the mountain, I check the warehouse, nothing is missing. Who is taking care of the warehouse? Well, in the last six months, Goya is taking care of the warehouse. And then he said, uh, the museum, it's clean and nice and all is covered with glass. It, it's different. Last time it was all dirty and dusty. Who fixed the museum? They said, well, Goya did. He says, what have you done to reward this soldier? Nothing. He's one of the best soldiers you have. Why do you have a meeting? We want to put a soldier in prison. Who do you want to put in prison? Goya. <laughs> he said, are you crazy? Why do you want to put him in prison? Well, he doesn't work on Saturdays. Does he work the other days? Oh yeah, he's the best worker we have. Why doesn't he work on Saturdays? Because he believes in God. Is he talking against the government? No, he prays for the government. Is he talking against the country? No, he says we should pray for the country. Is he doing propaganda? No, if you ask him, you say, yeah, I believe in God, but he is, he's a good kid. Then why do you want to put him in prison? He doesn't work on Saturdays. Leave him alone. If you touch him, you lose your jobs. You go to prison. Don't you ever touch him, you have to do with me. I will make sure that you will be punished for it. Listen to me, nobody should touch Goya. And then he left. As I got out of the warehouse, all the colonels and majors and lieutenants, everybody was greeting me. Hey Goya, how are you doing? Please talk to the general and tell him that we take good care of you. Please tell the general that we love you. We'll leave you alone, do whatever. You don't have to work on Saturdays. Don't worry, Goya. Tell the general that we love you. <laughs> From that day on, nobody bothered me again about Sabbath. But I had to fully surrender and say, Lord, do whatever you want to me. May your will be done. My brothers and my sisters, religion is not what you do. It's who you know. And unless, we know God, we have no religion. When the Christ will come, we will fail. Only those that have a daily, personal, continual relationship with him will resist in the last moment. I want to read one more quotation for you and then uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm gonna finish. I have the quotation here, give me one second. Okay, I hope you can still see me. Okay, I'm still seeking for that quotation. Give me one second, just be patient, please. If you are not patient, I will pray for you. Okay, I found the quotation. I wonder how can I share it with you? Do you have laptop says, with you? Excuse me? You can share screen. Okay, give me one second. Let me see how to share screen. I found it. Yep. I'm not the best in, in, in electronics, but any anyway, nevertheless. Desktop one, share. Can you see it now? Yes. Great. Those who make Christ their daily companion, will feel the powers of unseen world around them. By looking unto Jesus, they will become assimilated into his image. By beholding, they will become changed into the divine pattern. Those that walk and talk with God, to whom the invisible world is a reality, they express the peace of God and they carry with them the atmosphere of heaven I want to read one more. I'm looking for a different quotation. I will find it. Uh, 
Okay. Prayer is the breath of the soul, the secret of spiritual power. Prayer is the of faith is the great strength of the Christian that will uh, surely prevail against Satan. Uh, anyway, I I am not sure how to put this back. It's okay. Um, I'm trying to put this back the way it was before. And the sharing desktop. And you said, aha, wonderful. I, I'm learning stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, <clears throat> there is a quotation, I cannot find it, that says that those that pray and study, it says that prayer and study is the single weapon that will give us victory in the final conflict against Satan. I have the quotation, but I have here on my laptop four presentations that I had prepared, kind of, I had in mind for tonight, actually for today, because it's morning there. Four presentations, I didn't do any of them. I just talked to you openly, freely, without any presentation. But in one of the four presentations that I have in my, uh, on my laptop, on my desktop right now, one of the quotations says that prayer and study of the world are the single weapon that would surely give us victory over Satan. Is the single way to have victory in the final conflict. Those that are not used to pray, those that are not used to walk with Jesus and to know his voice will not be able to stand. Those that don't know God and don't make him their continual companion, continual presence to walk with him daily, to know him and to be in his presence continually, they will not stand in the final crisis. So God is calling the church to revival. God is calling the church to a deeper experience. If we procrastinate now, when are we gonna do it? In the final exam, that's too late. We need to start that today. May God bless you. Let me have a word of prayer for you. And then I, we are gonna end you can continue the way, you, whatever you have in worship. Father in heaven, we cannot thank you enough that you, the God of the universe, want to have a relationship with us. It is a greater privilege that we will ever understand. Please help us to thirst for you more than anything else. Help us to, to continually make you the center, the desire, the passion, the reason of our lives. Help us put you before anything else. Help us seek you, not your blessings, but your presence. There is nothing wrong to ask for blessings. It says in your word that we should cast all our needs upon you. But also it says in your words, that we should love you more than anything else, that we should seek you and your kingdom before anything else. Help us to put you in the center, to make you the priority, to know you, to love you, to trust in you, and to allow you to lead our lives the way you want daily. May that be our experience. We pray in Jesus' precious name, and we believe that you rejoice and you desire to answer this prayer, and you are working on it. We may not be able to see it, but we believe that all things work together, and you daily will work to answer this prayer. So, Father, in faith, we thank you for answering our humble prayer. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. This is a, thank you, Pastor, for sharing the word of God and praise God for a wonderful testimony. We're very blessed to hear what God has done in your life. And we're praying that the same testimony will be upon us and everyone who listen in this Sabbath morning. So, uh, Pastor, uh, we want to... Uh, um, right now, we will hear a closing song from our friend O'Shane Solomon. Are you here O'Shane? I'm going to leave the meeting. It's late here. God bless you.
All right. God bless you, Pastor. Bye bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye bye. God bless. Ocean, are you here? Oh, yes, I'm here. Awesome. Hearing me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so our closing hymn is hymn 167. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Alleluia, sing to Jesus, he the scepter, he is the throne. Alleluia, he is the triumph, he is the victory alone. Heart of wrong of peaceful Zion, thunder like a mighty flood. Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us by his blood. Alleluia, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Alleluia, he is near us, faith believes, no questions how. Through the cloud from side received him when the forty days were o'er. Shadow hearts forget his promise. I am with you evermore. Alleluia, bread of angels, though on earth or food or stay. Alleluia, hear the sinful flee to thee from day to day. Intercess a friend for sinners, earth redeemer, plea for me. Where the songs of all the sinless sweep across the crystal sea. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, who joined us.